clicker is here. All right, so really quick about me. So I went to BYU, obviously. Uh, graduated in entrepreneurial finance. Uh, met my wife here. She double majored in both economics and uh, poli sci. Got a scholarship to Pepperdine Law. And we currently live in Los Angeles. We've got two amazing daughters, five and three years old. And some of my hobbies, beach volleyball, snowboarding, guitar, film, international travel, food, and of course entrepreneurship. For those of you that are excited about being entrepreneurs, I hope you see business as your, your passion and as a, a true hobby, something that you could go and do for 80 hours a day or 80 hours a week and be just thrilled with it and excited for the challenge. So I, like Scott said, I own a company called Active. Uh, we specialize in environmentally responsible pest control solutions. We are the number one fastest growing service company in America. Uh, in 2,000 cities, 27 different states. Been featured in a bunch of different uh, news articles, uh, media publications, Forbes, Fortune, Wall Street Journal. And we're, we're on track to do about 160 million this year after about just over two years in business. I've also had, uh, this, this is my fourth venture. So I've had three prior that we've been able to sell in the, in the eight digit and nine digit range. All right, I'm curious, how many of you know the term dumb tax? Raise your hands. All right, you guys don't use this term. So I had a teacher here named Kirby Cochran. And Kirby, he said, you know, your goal as an entrepreneur is to avoid dumb tax. Anybody have a guess on what that means? What was that? Uh, dumb tax. I, I think some of those tax, like double taxation, I definitely think it's dumb. <laughs> but, so dumb tax is, it's the price you pay for when you make a mistake simply by not having gained the knowledge. Uh, or the experience prior uh, to making that mistake. So you could have avoided it. So that's my goal. I'm also curious, how many of you think entrepreneurs love risk? Raise your hands. Did I, did I ask it the wrong way? <laughs> um, I, I, I assure you that no entrepreneur is excited about jumping out of a plane without a parachute. That's not the type of risk we take. We like the risk that is calculated. We like to mitigate as much risk as possible. And one of the ways we can do that is through experience. And you guys are kind of hear my story today. That's one of the ways that I did it. So this is a Dumb and Dumber. This is going to date me as well. This is back when I was in high school. So Dumb and Dumber is a story about two individuals that decide to deliver a suitcase back to a customer. And they, they take off without giving it much thought. They're excited for the journey. And about in maybe Nebraska or Kansas, they run out of gas in their van. And they don't know what to do. And Lloyd gets this idea. He says, I'm going to trade the van for a moped because that's better gas mileage. And so that's what they do. And ultimately, they're driving to Aspen. What they didn't know is that it's snowing in Aspen and freezing. So you can see they ultimately, they arrive to Aspen. But you can see the snot kind of frozen underneath their noses. You know, so it's, it's very similar to an entrepreneur's journey. They got there, but not without a few battle scars. I recently wrote an article in Inc. Magazine. Uh, they called me and asked me to write uh, something about established industries and disruption within established industries. And I want to make sure you guys understand there's two types of innovation. Uh, some people think that you have to have this great big idea that's revolutionary in order to go be an entrepreneur. And that's just not the case. You know, I went into a very old blue collar industry, been around for over 100 years. And the first one is it's what we call evolutionary innovation or uh, traditional innovation. That's my type of industry. And then you have disruptive innovation where someone says, I got this crazy idea, it's gonna to totally disrupt another, maybe an old industry, or maybe it's a totally new industry like Facebook when it first came out. And uh, there's no business model, there's no traction, you know, there's no profits or ROI, and you probably need venture capital to be able to go do that. I'm curious, which one do you think is more risky? Disruptive, why? Yeah, nobody's ever done it. I mean, this, there's, a, there's an old saying, right? The, the pioneers take all the arrows. You know, the first one into battle uh, gets bloody. That's, that's disruption. And I have a huge amount of respect for uh, many friends that do entrepreneurship in this category. Uh, but there's a lot more risk associated with it. All right, so I want to set the stage a little bit about how I got, uh, kind of from the time I got back from my mission, and then where, uh, you know, how, how did I ultimately get into entrepreneurship? So, I got back from my mission from Panama City uh, in 99. And I started thinking, OK, what do I do? I need, I need to get a job. I need to get back to school. Uh, probably want to see if I can graduate debt free somehow. I took a job at a wakeboard snowboard shop. My day consisted in the summertime of wakeboarding in the summer in the morning, 
in the afternoon, I would go eat uh, lunch and then go lay out by the pool and read a book. And then at night, I'd go work at the shop. And during the, one of the lunch times, uh, or one of the periods, I, I had a friend that had this book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. How many of you have read Rich Dad, Poor Dad? All right, I'm impressed. Wow, well done. So Rich Dad, Poor Dad, for those of you who don't know, is a book about personal finance and making smart decisions and uh, accumulating wealth. And I thought, you know, this is a good book. I like this. I think someday I will try, if I find an opportunity, you know, maybe, it, maybe it's hard or whatever, but it pays more. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that and see if I can't you know, make myself financially uh, uh, stable. So uh, I had a friend who came to me and said, you know, I had, last summer I went out, I sold pest control in California, and I made about 25 grand doing that. And I thought, that is a lot more than what I'm making selling snowboards. I think I'm going to go try that. Uh, so I decided I'm going to go take that risk. And I was so excited, actually. I'd been planning it out. I said, OK, if I made that much each year over the four years I was in college, then I could graduate debt free. I could start you know, saving for a wedding ring in case that ever happens. And I can start saving for graduate school because I thought I wanted to go to MBA school. And so you can imagine how frustrating it was and how disappointed I was when I arrived to the area and sold zero for five days straight. Turned out I sucked at sales. Uh, so it was going to take some time in order to figure it out. Uh, I went to that, week, that weekend, after five days of selling nothing, I, literally, I, I knocked a thousand doors, and not a single person said yes, uh, which is actually really hard to do. And I, ha I had this problem. And entrepreneurs, we typically don't have problems. We call them opportunities, right, to be able to improve. I, I bought a bunch of sales books, about a half dozen sales books. I started reading about two hours every single night, late into the night. So I probably did that for almost three months. Uh, almost immediately, I started to begin selling. I went from the worst sales rep out of 200 sales reps to top rookie of the year by the end of the year. Gives you a little bit of intimation into my personality and what an entrepreneur is like. Uh, if you tell us you, that we can't do something, we're excited to be able to prove you wrong. So I created my own solution. Uh, I was the top first year rep. And the next year, I worked at this really large company my first year. It was a great company. Uh, but it was a little bit old. The mentality was, for salespeople, it's kind of like a wet rag. You know, bring them out, throw, throw a wet rag against the wall, see what sticks, and whatever doesn't, don't worry about it. And that really didn't make sense to me. I thought, why wouldn't, why wouldn't the program try to train people better? Why, why aren't there sales videos? Why isn't the training manual a lot more in detail about sales? And I found a company where someone else, uh, I'd sold 327 that first year, and I found another company where there's a 400 level uh, individual and a 500 uh, plus sales rep. If this, this might be one of the most important things I say to you guys today. Success breeds success. When I say that, it usually means write it down. The reason why is if you listen to them and you mimic success, oftentimes you can have that same level of success. It just rubs off over time. It's called the proximity theory. And I went to go work for this smaller company. I didn't realize how small it was. It probably would have scared me off if I understood it only had two locations and it had only been in business for a year. Uh, but the owner had run another large company, and this was kind of his first thing, and was doing well. When I got there, I found there was another problem. The problem was there was no sales training at all. He was a great sales trainer himself, amazing boss, super ethical, uh, very, very motivational. But we just didn't have the training. It was a very young company. And so I asked him out of self-interest, I said, can I write the training manual? You know, can we start creating training videos and find ways to help you know, these, these sales reps that I brought out, my recruits? And he said, yeah, I'd love that. So we started working on that together. And by the end of the summer, we had a, an amazing training manual. And our, our guys had sold almost 200 accounts per rep, which is almost double what the industry averages. Uh, I got promoted to vice president of sales uh, by doing that. Just by taking the initiative, doing something I wasn't necessarily going to get paid for, I knew that in commissions I would make more just by having my people get trained well. But a little extra initiative uh, can go a long way. Sometimes you know, if, if you work only for work and to get a salary, it's not necessarily the best the ways about going about things. If you want to get promoted in life, do something extra. You know, the difference between 100% and 110% is only 10%. Okay, so I did this for three years. We grew the company uh, from about one and a half million to 10 million in just three summers. And I, uh, this is kind of when opportunity meets uh, luck. Uh, so I, or I believe opportunity is when luck meets preparation. Uh, and this is how it happened for me. I was graduating, I had a 3.8 in uh, my business classes. Uh, I was about to interview with investment banks. 
my resume you know, included managing over 100 uh, different employees, and I was making a six-figure in college. I thought that was pretty cool. I thought that would look good to investment banks. And I went to my boss and I said, can I have you write me a really good letter of recommendation? I'm a little worried about how pest control is going to look to these fancy investment banks out in New York. And he says, you know, Dave, I gotta ask you a question. You're so good at this. Why are you, why are you gonna go work 80, 100 hour weeks for an investment bank? If you just took that time and put it into a pest control company, I think you'd make a lot more. Uh, and I think you'd have a lot of fun doing something that you're already good at. So it took me a while. I had this vision of going off and you know, kind of living this fancy finan uh, finance dream. And it took me a while to shift gears. I mean, that's kind of a 180, right? Uh, Wall Street to pest control. So I, start, I had something to think about. I started thinking about business, thought about all my classes that I was studying. Uh, and I actually changed my major. Ultimately, once I made the decision, I changed from uh, finance to entrepreneurial finance, so that it applied more into entrepreneurship. But if 80% of businesses fail within five years, and 97% of companies are out of business within 10 years, I thought, do I really want to take that risk? It's pretty scary. And I was reading a book called The E-Myth. I've heard you guys are no longer required to read this. But this book was the book that ultimately made my final decision to go forward with it. Uh, so I'm reading this book, and it was kind of like the, the light bulb turned on. Uh, number one, it basically said you need two things if you really want to be successful in entrepreneurship. Number one is experience. The more you know, you know, the more likely you are to have success in that specific field. And it's not just you know, experience in any business, it's experience in that specific field. And I want to ask you guys a quick question. The first one is, what is the definition of money? Who could tell me the definition of money? Let me help you. Who could tell me the definition of time? Time is money, right? And basic algebra says, therefore, money is time. So time is runway, right? It's the ability to get from uh, one, uh, one place to the next milestone in entrepreneurship. Uh, it, is, it buys you time to pay a little dumb tax along the way as well. So that's probably a good one to write down as well. The window of opportunity came, so I, I kind of decided this, and ultimately cash. That's why I would suggest make sure you've got two to three times the amount that you think you need because you just don't know what you don't know. And along the way, you're going to have surprises. All the financial forecasting you know, that I learned in school and that I used to ultimately draw up the model for my pest control business, you know, it was off. It just, it, even with the pro formas from my boss that he allowed me to use to kind of structure it, it, it just still, it still was off. So make, make sure you're prepared with cash. And the window of opportunity came. My wife got a scholarship to law school. We had actually saved, believe it or not, almost $300,000 selling pest control. We did not go get flashy cars. We didn't live in nice apartments. We lived dirt cheap because we were saving for her law school and for my MBA school so we could totally both graduate debt free. And when she got her, her uh, scholarship, it was like, okay, like, that's it. We're gonna take everything we have and we're gonna throw it into this business and try to grow it. So that's uh, opportunity, right? When luck and preparation cross paths. All right, so starting a company. My first company, I learned every single job description there was. And it was fun. Being an entrepreneur, especially a mom and pop, you, you get to learn, you're kind of the jack of all trades. So I learned every job from products to the operations to hiring, cut to the customer database, accounting, like things you never even knew were involved in a business, like workers comp and accounting and taxes, and it was not a fun one. Uh, you get to learn about phantom taxes. Uh, insurance, financial forecasting, you name it. Uh, I created written job descriptions to ensure best practices. This is where most mom and pop businesses fail, meaning they can't scale from one, a single location to two, three, 10, 100 locations. It's because they don't have best practices instituted and they don't train on them well to everybody else. They're more dependent upon themselves as the business owner in order to make it run. And I want to, uh, at the risk of losing major street cred with you guys, I want to tell you, I want to confess something that both Jeff Bezos and I, the founder of uh, Amazon, had in common. We both worked at McDonald's in our teens. So. Uh, <laughs> What's so funny is, as an entrepreneur, you draw from all your experiences in life. And back then, it, maybe it was a little bit embarrassing. I just I wanted extra money that my parents said, no, if you want, you know, if you want a car, we'll pay half. But you got to go out and earn that somehow. 
And so that's how I did that. Uh, but McDonald's, whatever you think about the food is what it is, but it is a well-oiled machine. Uh, I, I think I've heard before that like one in seven people in the United States have worked at McDonald's at one point in their life. I'm just curious, is anybody willing to admit this? Has anybody in here worked at McDonald's before? Yes, yes, these are my homies in here. All right, you guys and Jeff Bezos. Okay, so I worked 90 hours per week in my first business. I figured if I was gonna do investment banking, I might as well do it in my own business. Uh, never did that at McDonald's. And then uh, it was a huge success. We, on average, we sold three times the amount of sales that we did uh, with my previous company. Um, I almost went bankrupt. In fact, I would have gone bankrupt had my employees not given me the uh, time I needed in order to pay them. I actually went to some of my top salespeople who I had the most, and I said, can I pay you, uh, you know, in a couple months? I'll pay you 10% interest on the money I owe you, uh, but I need probably two or three months in order to, to do this because I was only planning on this many accounts you know, being sold. So it, it's interesting, most people don't think about that, but you can outgrow yourself and you can actually bankrupt yourself from too much success. Uh, in year three, I decided to try to scale my, to my first location. It was a fun experiment. I would go back and forth between San Diego and Orange County. Our office was actually in Corona. It was right between Orange County and, Inland, and the Inland Empire so that we could service a lot of area. And uh, it, was, it was a great test to see if the operation could run without me there all the time. And it was a lot of fun. Learned a few things, did it for a couple years, continued to refine the process. And what happens when you have a lot of success? Who comes knocking? Sometimes investors, sometimes people want to buy you out, right? So I had several private equity groups come to me. I had uh, some big large companies like Terminex come to me. And I, th I, was, I was at a crossroads. I thought, I wonder if I'm going to keep doing pest control or if I'm going to go back and chase my investment making dream. Maybe go to m and in New York or go to Venture Capital in San Francisco. And I thought, you know, I've done it this far along. It would really be cool to try to expand and see if I could have a regional company. You know, maybe... Out, you know, extend outside the state of California and try it in multiple states. So that's what I decided to do. I sold my business uh, for eight digits and then started, rolled that capital into the next business uh, to go even bigger. So I had a lot of dry powder. So we tested the model and actually we went into nine states west of the Mississippi. Uh, the, the new model was called Eco First. This was one of my, so my first incremental innovation was probably, you know, the, the whole sales program. Uh, and I did that before I actually got into entrepreneurship. So I didn't realize I was entering entrepreneurship. My second one was, I had been on the door so much, and I, I heard a lot of people saying, I wish there was a more family-friendly product, something that was more environmentally responsible. And so we, we totally owned it with our second company, Eco First, and just, you know, we specialized in using products where, you know, if, if a dog were to get into some sort of a, a product, it wouldn't matter. You know, it could lick the ground, eat a dead bug, it'd be fine. And we had, we had a lot of success that way. Uh, it involved a lot of travel. It was, it was killing me. I, I, there's a struggle entrepreneurs first go through when you first decide that you are going to um, you know, expand and scale. You don't trust everybody, and that's most entrepreneurs' problem is that they have to be all in all the time over everything, making sure it goes just perfect. And once you have really good people, it takes some time to get there. But once you have great people, you need to not micromanage. You need to step back. There's another lesson that I learned. So I learned how to create layers of management, uh, oversee the business from afar. And the best thing about that is that growth is opportunity for your people. The best feeling I get today, because once you make a bunch of money, it's kind of like, all right, made a bunch of money, so what? What's next? What's going to keep you going? It's, it's really the people. Like, at least for me, that's, that's what's done it. Uh, watching people come in at a basic level entry job, work their way up into management, into senior management. I have uh, our COO actually started with us came to work for us for $200 more a month, making, I think, $2,700 when he started. And he now makes, you know, a large six-figure income doing what he does. He doesn't have a college degree, but he's a very, very smart individual, reads all the time. Uh, everybody loves him. He's just a great guy. And it, that's exciting to me. I love providing opportunity to people. And we were ranked in PCT Magazine as the top fastest growing fast control company uh, in the United States and Canada, Mexico, uh, North America, I guess. I took zero salary for three years on this company. And the problem we had, what was going on in 2009? Do you guys remember? I started this business in 2009. Housing crisis, okay? The worst recession of my lifetime and hopefully yours. Uh, 
I read this book, Delivering Happiness. One of the things that we had done is we had scaled back because we didn't know how the recession was going to affect us. You know, the housing is tied to pest control services. And the toughest thing was we just didn't know what was going to ultimately happen. So it started to feel more corporate as we expanded. You know, there was rules for everything and best practices. And we tried to take this white collar approach to, pest, uh, to a blue collar industry. Uh, and I read this book. I started thinking about going back to MBA school to an executive MBA to try that. And this book probably saved me $120,000 in tuition because it taught me what I was looking for. My, my question was, how do I continue to grow and keep that same family feeling you know, that we had when we had just one location? Because that's when it was really fun. And the solution was ultimately culture. It was having core values. It was finding ways to have fun. And I, I had started studying uh, Silicon Valley. I looked at Google and Facebook and I'm studying Zappos and they had all these great fun things, you know, activities and retreats and amenities and just, they, it really felt like they were taking care of their people and I wanted to do that for my people but I didn't financially, I couldn't financially afford it. I'd gone three years without a salary. So uh, I had had some other people come and knocking and decided I'm going to sell this and I'm going to roll all that money into the next one as well. And this is one of, one of my favorite quotes from Tony Shea from that book. A great brand is a story that never stops unfolding. And this is where our incremental innovation really started humming. So my goal was to build a better company, not just a bigger one. And there's this uh, Japanese philosophy called Kaizen. H has anybody heard of Kaizen? OK, a few. So what, what is Kaizen? Anybody? Incremental progress. Yes? Through what? It's, so it's continuous improvement from the, the lowest guy in the totem pole all the way to the executive team. It's their way of getting everybody involved and having everybody's ideas so that everybody feels like they're you know, on board. Uh, I had this goal to make pest control sexy. So forever, pest control, and it still is, I'm not, I'm not gonna lie here, pest control's pretty blue collar, guys. It's not a very sexy industry. It's probably you know, close to janitorial services. Uh, no offense to the janit if there's any janitors in this room. And I started thinking, okay, how do I, how do I make this unique? Uh, and here's some of the ways we're going to do it, and I'll, I'll actually explain it through each different video, or each different uh, slide. Okay, so I said we sent an email out to all of our people, and we said, if there were core values to our company, what should they be? Because instead of it being, what would Dave do, I want it to be, what should the company do? Like, what do we stand for? You know, what is our mission? As opposed to just kind of writing a cheesy mission statement, you know, and maybe having something posted on the wall. What do we actually feel? What, who do we really want to be? And so we came up, uh, there was about 200 responses from our employees at the time. And we, the executive team, we tried to whittle them down to ultimately, we, we had 10 initially, and then we whittled them down even further into six, just so they were simple and easy to remember. Uh, we started really promoting ourselves online through Facebook and Instagram, which probably today seems like a no-brainer, but it was, it was a young, concept back then or a younger idea to even to do that. Why would a company need a Facebook page? It seems silly. Uh, we decided that we were going to give a portion of our profits back to charity. So Nothing But Nets, this is a group that, you know, there's over 750,000 people that die from malaria every year, which is transmitted by the mosquito bite. We decided, you know, that's a great uh, charity that we can really get behind, right? We're a pest control company. We started inventing uh, all kinds of gear, you know, and swag, you know, that people actually wanted to wear. I don't know how many of you have got if you work for a company and they gave you like a shirt with the company name, but most of the time it's not something you want to wear. It's more like a rag, you're going to cut it up and maybe use it to clean the toilet or something. So we decided, let's, let's create some really cool gear that people are excited to wear. So then it, then it started getting really crazy. I hired, a, I hired a group, an interior designer called Rap Studios, and these guys have worked with Google and North Face and a bunch of different tech companies. The Adobe building uh, was created by them. And uh, shout out to Sorry, uh, Corey Sistrunk for all his help with this. But we, uh, we put in an NCAA basketball court at our headquarters. We had ping pong, foosball, pool tables. We put in a golf simulator. We had a lot of guys that liked to golf, but they couldn't you know, golf during the wintertime in Utah. So we said, let's try this. Uh, we, just, we made it a place where people wanted to, to, to go. And so when most people walk into our organization, they say, what is this? Like, a, What tech company is this? Or is it an advertising firm? Like, it's not what most people think of pest control. And we wanted to, I wanted to create a place that said, I care about my people. Because as we got bigger, one of the growing pains I had was 
it's just hard because you don't get to, you can't know everybody. In my first location, I knew everybody's name, I knew their kids' names, I knew what their kind of their dreams were, their aspirations in the company or outside the company. And when you have several hundred employees, it gets really hard. And now with 3,500 employees, it's it, it's impossible. You can only know so many people at once. So that was my goal. When people came here, they said, you know what, this this employer really cares about people. Uh, some some other innovations. We decided to start doing a lot of incentives based around our core values. Uh, we take our, our top salespeople to either Hawaii, we went to the Dominican Republic last year, last year we took 150, 150 people there. Uh, we got a suite at the Jazz Arena, you know, just for our people. Uh, we have a branch manager or an operations manager retreat every year where we get together and we brainstorm the best ideas and we have the best branches that are, you know, doing something well in a specific area, get up and talk to everybody else to kind of brain share that knowledge. Uh, here's us in Moab, taking all the guys out. Uh, we've had some concerts, and we've got this big basketball court, and we said, well, what can we do with this space? And uh, we've had uh, Dan Reynolds from the Imagine Dragons come play, and Tyler Glenn from the Entry, and some EDM DJs come play. We've got about 3,000 people who are jammed. It's kind of hard to see at night. So the late Stephen Covey, uh, always been a big fan, read all of his books. Uh, he, he said, always treat your employees as you want them to treat your best customers. And I really believe that. Because a lot of people said, Dave, I, I think you're overdoing it. You know, these other incentives, are, they're, you know, all these things, they're, they're really for tech companies, you know, because they're trying to attract the best talent. And I said, well, I'm trying to do the same thing. And I really believe it will, you know, they'll, the employees will pass it forward. It was a big gamble. And I actually had the Wall Street Journal reach out to me and talk to me. Uh, it had got, word had got back to them that we were doing all this for a blue collar industry, which was pretty rare at the time. And I came up with this term, I guess, I said, you know, I call it millennializing. You know, and they said, you know, does, do all these things actually help a business? You know, can you prove it? And at the time, I didn't have a whole lot of traction. I just, we were just growing like crazy. And the main ways I, I felt like it uh, was working was it was a lot easier to attract top talent. It was so easy to retain top talent. If you have all these things and the other competition doesn't, who are they gonna go with, right? And since then, there's been some studies that have come out. So for example, Columbia University came out with uh, these types of things can increase your productivity by about 20% in the workforce. Uh, it obviously increases customer retention. We saw that as well. Uh, it can increase your profitability. Uh, Harvard actually, let's see. Harvard was on productivity, and Columbia was actually this other one, increased employee retention by up to 35%. And then uh, Sony actually does a lot of internal processes and they were measuring different departments. And they showed the statistics where it can increase your profitability up to 30% and increase your earnings growth by 39%. So that actually it is quantifiable. In the short term it's hard to see, but long term uh, it is there. So we started, we got a lot of, uh, after that article we started getting more press uh, in different publications. Uh, we started winning a bunch of awards. Uh, so this is me with Seth, Seth Myers uh, when I won the National Entrepreneur of the Year Award. Uh, guys, if you ever go to an award ceremony, make sure to take your spouse. Uh, I won the regional competition here. And I just thought, there's no way. It, I mean, why? I'm going to fly down to Palm Springs and go to the national competition only because I promised uh, you know, the regionals that I would go. They looked me in the eye and they said, will you go? And I said, yeah, I'll go. I told my wife, I said, there's no way I'm going to win this. Don't worry about it. I'm going to go down. We had a newborn. It just seemed like a lot of work at the time. Uh, and when I called her, she knew it. She's like, you're, telling, you're calling to tell me you won, huh? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> and she's like, I knew it. I was like, well, I, I'm glad you have more faith than I did in myself. Um, we also won the American Business Awards for fastest, fastest growing service company in the United States. Uh, the, the main way we ultimately have done this, and this kind of takes me into the next phase of entrepreneurship. So I've, I've been through three ventures at this point, and I love this quote by Mahatma Gandhi. A sign of a good leader, it's not how many followers you have, but how many leaders you create. To me, that's profound. Uh, this is a picture of all of our leadership team. Many of these people have been with us along this journey for you know over a decade. And what I learned was great culture creates great people, and, or attracts great people, and great people ultimately create a great company. That's been the biggest formula of success uh, for me you know, at, the, at this stage. And as I, you know, I came across, across this quote right about the same time when I started thinking, you know what, my leadership team, I think they're finally ready. 
For those of you that have read Rich, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, you may have read the follow-up book, The Cash Flow Quadrant. Anybody read that? Okay, good. So you remember the box? You know, it's like employee, self-employed, business owner, investor. And I thought, I'm ready. I think it's time for me to move to I and move into the investor box. So I decided to actually sell the business uh, to take a step back. And I did about 80, 80 hour weeks, 70 to 80 hour weeks for over a decade, almost 12 years. And so it's probably time to step back. We started having our family at that point. And I thought I'm gonna give 20% of my company away to all my people that have helped me along you know, on this journey. Uh, every single manager from sales managers to regional sales managers to branch managers, operations managers, um, executive team, everybody's gonna have a piece of the next one. To me, this was kind of like an insurance policy. If I'm gonna step back and really take more time off and just focus on innovation within the company, you know, spend more time with my family, work maybe more of an eight to sixer, uh, you know, which is about as little as I work. Uh, I thought that would be a good incentive uh, to really drive the company. And what's crazy is the company has grown faster now than it ever has before. I kind of questioned why didn't I give everybody, you know, an incentive before? Why didn't I give equity away previously? So, Aptive Environmental is our current company. We really want to build a legacy brand, and. I haven't told anybody this. I'm going to disclose something to you guys in a second. This is really Kaizen 2.0 for us. We're really trying to use all of our people to continually improve. This has been a really big focus. Uh, you know, if you're not growing, you're dying in business. And if you're not continually adapting, you're going to die. Uh, a good example of that is the Fortune 500 was created, when was that? It was back like in the maybe 1955. Guess how many people or how many companies are still on the Fortune 500 today? about 5%. And those are the best of the best companies that have ever been around in history, at least in the United States. Uh, leadership, huge focus here, create leaders. Uh, just keep helping key employees capture that vision. You always have to be selling your vision as an entrepreneur uh, and finding new people to carry it on without you because you can't scale without that. And I'm gonna tell you, guys. so this is it. Our goal today this is the first time I've actually really announced it publicly. We've been talking about it internally now for about six months. We're going to try to go for a billion dollar valuation by 2022. Never would have thought pest control that was possible. I just got off the phone with a banker from Goldman Sachs on Friday discussing the idea. And we talked to several other brokers uh, prior to that. And uh, that's the goal now. So we'll see if we can be the first pest control unicorn in Utah. All right, so I want to share just a few tips for success in entrepreneurship that I've learned along the way. Uh, so you've got to learn how to conquer your fears. Um, I, I love the example of comparing entrepreneurs to gladiators because every time you get into the ring, you're that much more likely to die. Every day you go to work, statistically, you know, companies are just dropping like flies along the way. Now, I, I don't know that that's necessarily true for experienced companies. You get so good at something that eventually, you know, you're actually, it's a, it's a huge competitive advantage for you, similar to where we're at right now. Uh, but. The, the, your real enemy is fear. Fear is the four letter F word in business. It kills countless dreams. It paralyzes people from achieving what they really want out of life. Uh, you gotta bring that inner gladiator inside of you out and, and put that guy in charge. Uh, problems are just builder, muscle builders, right? They're just opportunity. You know, if you look at problems as, if you get frustrated every time you see a problem, you might not be an entrepreneur, I don't know. You have to salivate. It's like the Pavlov, uh, Law, right? When the bell rings, you, you know, there's a problem. It's like, all right, let's go. And uh, entrepreneurship is is a place for gladiators. It's not a place for dabbling wannabes, guys. Some I, I know some people they like the idea of being something. I remember in college, or when I was in high school, I said I think I want to be a doctor someday because I thought that was thought that sounded cool. And then I took my first chemistry class, Chem 105, it was at 8 a.m. in the morning. I don't think I kept showing up after about three weeks. Got an unofficial withdrawal, had to retake it later. But that was kind of the end of my uh, doctor dream. <laughs> so you've got, it's got to be more than just wanting to be something. It's, it's kind of like you know, like you're going to do this no matter what. Uh, it's gasoline on a fire, right? When somebody says something like, yeah, you can't do that. You just, you're excited to go prove them wrong and find a way to, to work, work through it. I also think it's really important to find your why. So why do you want to be an entrepreneur? You know, why do you have to go grow this specific type of business? What is it? What's exciting about that? If you find your why first, the how will come later. 
So writing down maybe a dozen ideas, two dozen ideas of why you have to do it. Getting le uh, leverage over yourself by dream dreaming big uh, is really, really important. And also business, you know, I think a lot of business owners get a bad rap, right? You know, they, the, the one percenters or the evil business owners, uh, you know, they're creating this system for people. Like, you hear that sometimes in the media. And to me, business is really spiritual. It's such a great place. I think it's, it is one of the most noblest professions that one can have. And the reason is, is because, you know, it, it involves faith, it involves courage, uh, charity, and you get to help so many people to, to grow and to provide jobs and to provide for families. Okay, learn how to sell. Granted, I probably have some bias on this, but entrepreneurs are sellers. They're always selling. They have a vision and they're getting people around their vision and, and excited about it. So uh, Mark Cuban, he said, if you're willing to go door to door, you can sell anything. Uh, your ability to persuade, it affects every aspect of your life and business. And it's not just in business, guys. You know, it's not just sales and marketing. It's, uh, it has to do in your relationship, you know, with your spouse. You know, you have to be able to persuade from time to time. Uh, in your, if you're a church leader, or you know, if you just have a management job somewhere, like you've gotta be able to persuade people all the time about your ideas you know, in order to get promoted, in order to seem credible. By the way, all these people actually did door to door. So Sarah Blakely from Spank, she's a billionaire. Michael Dell, another billionaire that uh, started off his computer business just selling door to door. Uh, Ray Kroc from McDonald's, he sold door to doors. A lot of people that initially started door to door. And what I loved about my door-to-door -door experience was I met so many different types of people. I actually knocked over 60,000 doors during the four summers that I did it. And you meet people from every background, you know, middle income, upper income, uh, you know, what, whatever race, whatever religion. And it's, it's so fascinating. You, you start learning a lot about different things that uh, different demographics like. It's extremely helpful. Choose your team wisely. You guys have probably heard that venture capitalists bet on people as opposed to just the idea because you know the idea you can iterate or you can actually pivot and go to a whole totally different idea but if you've got the right team eventually they're going to figure it out and make it work or at least hopefully 95 percent of the time they don't but at least that's the goal so choose your team wisely people will either inspire you or they will drain you and if you have people that are draining you it's not fair to keep them around because it hurts everybody else in your team so that's, that's actually a really hard thing to do because you want to be a human being, you want, to, you want what's best, you want to help people improve, but at some point you have to gauge whether they can or can't and you've got to make that call. And that's a tough one. I don't know if I've said this, but I'm going to say it now. You guys are the sum of your five closest friends. This is one of the reasons why network uh, entrepreneurs, they network with each other. Uh, they need to find other believers in themselves. You're the sum of your five closest friends. Tell me where you'll be in five years, and I will tell you where you will be. I'm sorry. Tell me who your friends are, and I'll tell you where you'll be in five years. Also, choose your spouse wisely. This is a big one, because if you choose a spouse that wants somebody that works a, a nine-to-fiver, uh, you're, you're going to have a hard time in this. So make sure he or she is totally aware of what your plans are. I was very lucky in that I chose a spouse who had big career ambitions. She wanted to go into litigation. Uh, so the first three years she did law, uh, law school. The next six years she practiced in law. And then we started our family. Uh, you know, that's not for everybody. Uh, it, was, it was perfect for me because while she's studying you know, 80 hours a week at law school, I'm working 90 hours a week, 100 hours a week at my business. Uh, so we were both very happy that way. I think it's really important to plan goals together. And so we love traveling. Uh, we've seen probably 25 different countries. You know, like I'm nowhere near Davis Smith. If Davis has spoke to you guys, I'm not sure. I <laughs> think he's over 60. I'm trying to catch up with Davis. Uh, but yeah, if, if she's not on board, you, get, you guys are not gonna be happy. So make sure you guys have really got that nailed. Standing for something. This one's really important, guys. Uh, I never want to meet the tax man someday. I could, I'm, very, I'm, I'm overly cautious in my taxes. I've actually had accounts when I go out to eat. Uh, my father-in-law, <laughs> I'm gonna get in trouble since it was on video. But my father-in-law once said, hey, uh, why don't you write this off? You know, we're talking business over dinner. I'm like, well, but yeah, it's family and it's not really like, we're not really talking about a specific, this isn't like a specific meeting or whatever. So like, I wouldn't write it off. Like I'm overly cautious about taxes. 
don't want to ever have to meet the tax man or go to jail. Uh, my mom, uh, my mom passed away this last year, and it's, it's made me think a lot about what my mom taught me. And this is a big one. She said, and she used to tell me all the time, integrity is what you do when nobody else is looking. Um, you know, in, in our industry, summer sales uh, has a mixed reputation, uh, and it, unfortunately, it comes from people that you know they claim that well, the end justifies the means. And I'll give you guys an example. I had a a salesperson who had a sales team. They were doing over a million dollars a year for my company. And I found out that this salesperson was stealing off of sales from us, going into the computer and changing things. And I had a decision to make. Was I gonna pass on a million dollars? Because I knew this individual was gonna take a sales team and go somewhere else. Uh, and I thought, is it worth a million dollars to me to let this person go? And I let the person go. You have to make, you, you have to make a stand at some point. And it's so much easier to be honest 100% of the time instead of 98% of the time. Time management. Okay, there's a class, and I'm not sure if it's still here. Is anybody taking the class uh, student effectiveness? Does that exist anymore? Man, you guys are missing out. This is such a good class. It was like a little one credit class. Uh, and I, I'm so grateful for my teacher uh, for everything she taught me. So I'm going to go through some of these things. This is probably, if you want to build relationships with people, time management is huge. So number one, if you want to create loyal employees and, and raving fans, this is how you do it. First, return calls. It seems like common sense, but return calls quickly within the same day. Don't hold off. My industry is horrible for that. If you think of like the construction industry, even worse. Uh, respond to texts, respond to emails. Uh, always have a same day communication policy. Beat deadlines. Avoid the 11th hour syndrome. In college, I can't say that I did that all the time. I procrastinated a lot in college. But once I finally, after I got married uh, and still had another um, year in college, it was, it was helpful. I actually started planning things out so that we could still, my wife and I could go do things on weekends. And when I started studying for a test five days in advance, it made it so much easier. And I, I, you know, I got straight A's from uh, then on. So remember that great quality work doesn't come you know, in a rush scenario, it just doesn't. Uh, be early. You know, it's better to arrive 15 minutes earlier than, than to be five minutes late. That's my philosophy. And people, they, they know they can count on you. It's not an excuse to let you, let you go. Uh, the daily calendar. So, you guys remember, oh, uh, well, actually, I'm not sure if you guys even use this anymore. So, in the mission, they had this sheet. It was actually from Stephen Covey. And it has the whole week laid out. I could show it to you guys, but you think I was crazy because I cross everything out when I'm done. I actually get a hit of dopamine every time I do it. Um, I love it. <laughs> but I like looking at my calendar a full week. Got it. And uh, what you want to do is you want to put things in A's, B's, and C's, meaning A is the most important. B is, yeah, you should probably get to it today, but it's not a have to. And C is you can bump this out anytime. A lot of people, they focus on B's and C's, and that's, that's a big mistake. Uh, and just outwork the competition. If you work an extra hour, two hours per day, that's an extra three months over the year. I was working, you know, an extra 40 hours a week on top of the original 40, so get a lot done during that time. Finally, leaders and readers, got to read one book minimum per month. You know, read at least 30 minutes per day, no matter what. Subscribe to Audible. Use what's called net time. Note when you have no extra time, when you're walking to class, when you're driving to school, that's when you listen to your book. Uh, ed education is a lifelong process. I'm one of the only people that kept my business books, uh, that, at least that I know of, for my class or for my classes. And I use those actually uh, during the early years of my business to start that. Good is the enemy of great. You know, always choose your best. Is a, you know, the good, better, best talk by Dallin H. Oaks. Love that talk. It's one of my favorite. And then finally, enjoy the journey, guys. You're going to have lots of tough times in entrepreneurship. I really enjoy um, Sir Richard Branson, to me, is a crazy role model. Uh, this is a guy who has eight different businesses that have done over a billion dollars. Eight. And I'm trying to just get to one. So stay humble, uh, enjoy the journey, and thanks so much for your time.